This is Pat Solver with the Dr. Ways In, and I'm at my alma mater, UCSF, UC San Francisco, and standing in front of a plaque uh, that's honoring Lloyd Hollingsworth Smith, but we didn't call him that. We called him Holly Smith, who was the chief of medicine during my medical school and my residency. So it was a thrill, and it's also a thrill to have with me a colleague who trained about the same time as me, about. a little <laughs> bit later, uh, although we have a lot of people that we know in common. That's true. And that's uh, Bob Wachter, who is a professor of medicine and assistant chair of the Department of Medicine. Did I get that right? Associate chair, but, but associate enough. chair of the Department of Medicine, soon to be assistant chair. <laughs> oh, no, that's <laughs> oh, a demotion. We'll oh, that's a demotion, <laughs> but we don't want to do that. And Bob has written a fantastic new book, which I had a chance to read, called The Digital Doctor. So welcome, Bob. Thank you, Pat. It's a great pleasure. What, what I wanted to do is to um, ask you, well, wh why did you write this book? Um, you are the father of hospital medicine, so I know you play around with a lot of gadgets, but what really was the motivation to write this book now? Well, I've been studying patient safety and medical errors for about 15 years, and I've been waiting for computers to enter my world and figured they would fix most of the problems. And on top of that, we all have our iPhones, and it's just so magic that I think all of us have been waiting for this day where we would computerize, and we finally computerized. And all of a sudden, I started seeing things happen, like doctors and patients not looking each other in the eye anymore, and uh, all sorts of kind of unanticipated consequences. And then we had a really major medical mistake here that was really because of a computer system. And it dawned on me that this was not going as well as I would have hoped. Nobody had really written about that. The things that people had written about healthcare IT were either overly technical or, to me, a little bit hypey. And I thought it was, I really wanted to understand why it was as hard as it seemed to be. And I figured once I understood, I might be able to explain it to others in a way that was interesting and might help us debate it. Well, it's a very entertaining book, and uh, although I am a physician, I, I read it really more with a consumer hat on, so it was fantastic. Um, so why don't we start out by um, having you tell me a little bit about what, what would you say if you were wrapping up kind of the major theme of the book? Can you do that in a, in a sentence or two? What, what was the point that you were trying to make or the point that came out after you completed the book? I'd say there are a couple of big ones. One is that healthcare has only just gone digital, and you know this very well, in the last few years, which is remarkable. And we did it very quickly because of the federal incentive. So we went in a few years from being a primarily analog to a primarily dig digital industry. I don't think we've done it very well. And I think the main problem there is that we treated this as a technical change. Just put in computers and turn on the switches and it will make things work fine, because we're kind of used to that in the rest of our consumer apps. Uh, but this is a, an extraordinarily complex uh, change that involves changes in the way we think, the way we train, the way we organize our work. I think we're still organizing our work in analog ways, and we've just overlaid computers. I think we have to rethink the practice of medicine in the digital era, and that will involve the people who use the computers, doctors, nurses, patients, to be much more involved in the design process than they have been so far. Do you see it starting to happen, or is this something that's, uh, that needs to have advocates and it'll be something that takes place sometime way in the future? I think it's starting to happen, but not enough. And to be fair to the vendor community, they have a much tougher problem than Boeing has. Boeing is building a plane, and they control the entire ecosystem. It's on a lot in Seattle, and they don't release it until the whole thing is done, and they can see how all the integrated parts work together. If you're Epic or Cerner, you're building a, a computer system, and then you send it out to a thousand different places, and some of them might be a rural clinic, and some of them might be like this, a 600-bed academic medical center. They have a very different feel in those places. But there is a process that does bring users in. I think some of the vendors do it better than others. What I worry about is nobody is forced to do that. And, uh, and I don't think the philosophy, one of the things I saw in Boeing was, was there is a deep sort of respect for the pilots and the, and the lessons the pilots have learned over the years basically because people have died to, 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 to build that knowledge. I don't think there is the same reverence for the plight and the knowledge of frontline doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and I think that's, that philosophy has to change if we're going to do better here. Well, it's interesting you say that because um, these systems, when they don't do well, can 
also result in, in deaths or injuries or, or serious medical problems. And you wrote about one of them in the book. I wonder if you could describe that for us. Yeah, I chose one particular case because I think it really d demonstrates a lot of the, uh, of the issues. And let me just say parenthetically, when there's an error uh, in aviation, a plane goes down, it makes the news, it's incredibly visceral, and everybody says, we got to fix that. In medicine, we do this one at a time, and often we're quite silent about it. And so this is actually an important case, both because it's, it's an important case, but because UCSF, to its credit, allowed me to go public with it, and that often doesn't happen. The case involved a 16-year-old teenager who was hospitalized here, who was supposed to be getting, among many other medicines he was on, one pill, one antibiotic pill called Septra twice a day, and we ended up giving him 38 and a half pills and, in one shot. Astonishing it overdose. Is, it is an astonishing overdose. And when I did a deep dive into the error and did that by interviewing the nurse, the doctor, the pharmacist, the patient, his mother, and the people who designed our computer systems, what I came to realize was there were a number of kind of classic technology human interface glitches, like the, the, the first glitch was that the system was set on milligrams per kilogram rather than milligrams. And those are two different ways it can be set. It was set on one rather than the other, and it's actually hard to notice which one. So that was the first one. But the real nature of the error was that alerts appropriately fired. The doctor got an alert saying this is an overdose. The pharmacist got an alert saying this is an overdose. They got ignored each time. You might say, how could they do that? Were they asleep at the switch? Well, it turns out the doctors get thousands of alerts every day, every week. The pharmacist gets tens of thousands of alerts. Here at UCSF in a month in our intensive care unit, the uh, computer monitors threw off 2.5 million alerts. So people are going to ignore those unless we think about design in a new way. The final uh, step of this relay race, unfortunately, was a young nurse who saw this order for 38 and a half pills and said, that's really strange, that's kind of weird, and then said, but I know to get to me, it had to go through a doctor and a pharmacist, and I'm gonna check it to be sure. And so she barcoded it. She barcoded pill number one, and the barcode machine at that stage of the process is there to defend the order. So the barcode thought the right dose was 38 and a half pills. She barcodes pill number one. The barcode machine says, I need to see 37 and a half more. And so picture the clerk at the Safeway barcoding 38 items one after another. That's what she did, tore them open, and gave this kid 38 pills. Obviously, nurse, doctor, pharmacists all feel terrible about this now, but I came to realize in analyzing this that these are good people in a system that was really not designed for safety. Right. So, um, well, this has been wonderful chatting about, um, uh, about the book, and our time together is almost up, but I wanted to ask you when the book is coming out, and I'm assuming we can all get it on Amazon. Um, Absolutely. Uh, give us um, give us some information about so it. So the book is already available in the ebook. Uh, the book book will be out on April seventh, as will the uh, the audible copy dictated by my son. So I was very proud of that. I just spent the last four days in a studio downtown with him doing the uh, doing the narration of the book. Uh, but uh, April seventh, uh, it will come out, and it's already sold almost 10,000 copies, so there seems to be a lot of interest in the topic. It definitely is one of those topics where if you get a group of doctors in a room or nurses and say, tell us about how computerization is going, it's like you've pushed this button and it's hard to get people to shut up. It's not that it's the bad thing, but we have not yet gotten it right. Okay, great. So I hope everybody has a chance to get their hands on the digital doctor. And I want to thank you very much, Bob, and you. wish you luck. I'm assuming you're going to be pretty busy after April 7th doing a lot of before, book tour kind of things. Before and after, yeah. It's, it's actually very exciting.